your Android and Apple mobile devices. The Simple Truth, rising up to explore the difficult topics of real life. Join us as we proclaim the good, the true, and the beautiful with the simple truth of Jesus Christ and His Holy Catholic Church through Scripture, Tradition, and the Catechism. And now, your host, Jim Higgins. It is great to be back with you on The Simple Truth. We consecrate everything to the Sacred Heart of Jesus through the Immaculate Heart of Mary and the Pure Strong Heart of St. Joseph. Today is Testimony Tuesday, where we bring you real, live, first-hand testimonial accounts of the life-giving reality of Jesus and his Catholic Church. Our guest today is Nathan Wigfield. He is a Catholic husband and father, the executive director of the St. Thomas More House of Prayer, a Catholic retreat center in the Diocese of Erie, Pennsylvania, that has the mission of praying and promoting the Liturgy of the Hours. You can learn more by going to liturgyofthehours.org. We're very blessed to have him here with us today to share some of his personal testimony. Nathan Wigfield, thank you for being with us. How are you today? Hey, Jim, I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Yes. Thank you for being here with us. And uh, we, we always begin at the beginning. Uh, we start with childhood. What was your early life like, your family, the culture that you grew up in? Yeah, you know, I was really blessed to have grown up in a strong Christian household, a uh, mother and a father who loved the Lord very much, uh, who instilled the faith in my brother and my sister and I. And um, yeah, it was really from my earliest memory, I, I remember you know Christ really being at the center of our family life. Uh, I grew up evangelical. Uh, we, uh, the denomination that we ended up settling into was the Christian and Missionary Alliance. But um, you know, some, some of my earliest memories are of uh, being at home with my mom and her kind of blaring Amy Grant and Michael W. Smith on the radio. And, uh, you know, we grew up to Salty the Songbook, if that, you know, rings a bell for anybody uh, watching shows like McGee and Me and uh, these kinds of things. And so, uh, you know, one of the things that was really impressed upon me growing up was just the absolute importance of having a personal relationship with Christ. And uh, that was mostly, uh, you know, done through a life of, of prayer, uh, of reading the scriptures, of, of attending church, and then uh, just also just of kind of living, living the faith as best as we could. Um, you know, I still remember, you know, as a, as a young kid, uh, my mom and my dad praying with me, you know, I think it was at bedtime when I was around maybe nine or 10 years old, you know, saying the sinner's prayer and accepting Jesus into my heart. And, uh, you know, it's a real, it wasn't just a kind of one-time thing. Uh, it was understood and it was really instilled in me that this was a lifetime commitment and that this was something that, you know, if I, I was ready to do it, that I was making a promise to the Lord. Um, and, uh, and so I really believe, you know, uh, through the years growing up that, especially in, the, in, the, in those younger years, a lot of graces were uh, given me and instilled in me and, I'm just uh, very thankful for uh, the way that uh, my parents raised me and, uh, and also for just the great uh, witness that they were to me um, as, as my mom and dad, you know, as growing up as a child. So, mm -hmm. yeah, share with us a, a little bit about the, uh, the, the culture surrounding you at that time. Was it all um, similar families um, to yourselves, uh, faithful evangelical um, Christians that, um, that, that you were uh, getting to meet and be around what, what was the school like what was the, the time with others like um, what was your faith challenged in those early years at all what was the culture like yeah i you know when i was real young uh, my parents were part of a small group you know i, I still do have uh, memories of uh you know other moms and dads coming over to the house and they would bring their kids and uh, we would uh, go downstairs with the babysitter while the moms and dads would uh, be upstairs doing a Bible study and uh, singing praise uh, praise songs together. And sometimes the kids would come up and join in, and and so uh, that was very much kind of part of uh, part of our life together. Um, I ended up moving uh, when we ended up moving when I was about ten years old from Lancaster area uh, in Pennsylvania to a small town called Emporium. And uh, this was in north central uh, Pennsylvania. So uh, when, once we moved, uh, we were look, naturally looking for a church to settle into. And that's when we found a Christian Missionary Alliance church. And 
Uh, this was a church, yeah, with many, uh, you know, faithful evangelical families um, who, you know, took the faith very seriously. It's where it ended up meeting my wife. Uh, so her family went to this church as well. And, uh, but my mom and dad, they were actually leaders of our youth group. And, uh, and so they would get the kids together on Sunday mornings and we would, uh, we would pray together. We'd read the scriptures, you know, they'd give us a lesson. They would always incentivize, uh, personal devotions. Uh, so, you know, we would, uh, be, uh, challenged to make it a commitment every day to read our Bibles, to take notes of how the Lord was speaking to us to keep a prayer journal. And uh, those who had the most, uh, you know, the most days complete, I think it was in a month, uh, at the end of the month would be able to go out for, uh, for brunch after, after church. So um, yeah, we, and my, my parents also would always have us kids, uh, you know, especially into the teenage years, uh, they would have us over for, you know, things like Super Bowl parties and, you know, fun events as well. Um, but uh, but really, you know, their desire was to share the faith and instill the faith in in us and in in all of our friends, and uh, they did that they did that very well. Now, I grew up going to public school, um, and uh, most of my friends, uh, you know, I, I would say were loosely kind of Christian. Uh, you know, some were you know gro- most were growing up kind of going to church uh, in some uh, in some place at some place, but. Uh, you know, and I, I did have some Catholic friends as well. You know, growing up, I guess I'll uh, say something uh, with regards to this. You know, is uh, you know, Catholicism was kind of a little bit foreign to me, but not not terribly. It was uh, my mom's side of the family was all Catholic, so uh, my mom had grown up Catholic, and uh, after uh, she married my dad, uh, she had left the church and they had ad- joined a, a you know an evangelical church, and. Uh, so, but I still had, you know, aunts and uncles and, you know, extended family who are Catholic. Uh, but, you know, growing up, we would always kind of stress and, and kind of say, you know, well, you know, we here in our church, you know, we're kind of more about a relationship. Catholics are more about religion. And uh, unfortunately, my mom grew up not knowing a whole lot about the Catholic faith. She uh, was part of a very a faithful Catholic family in the sense of, you know, going to mass every Sunday and, uh, you know, I think to, uh, you know, praying the rosary and, uh, they would have, uh, you know, their priests over for dinner, you know, pretty frequently. And, uh, you know, so it wasn't that it wasn't part of their life, but, uh, she, catechesis wasn't a strong point, uh, at that time, at least for her. And, uh, when she married my dad, uh, a lot of the question, you know, questions that he would ask as to why, you know, why do you do this? Why do you do that in the Catholic church? Uh, she had no answers, uh, so she ended up leaving. But, uh, but yeah, just to come back, um, you know, I she still took us to, even though she had left the church, uh, she still took us to Good Friday service every uh, every Lent. And uh, I, you know, that's actually my first memory of Catholicism was going to Good Friday service and going into uh, Saint Mark's uh, Saint Mark's Catholic Church there in Emporium. And uh, immediately kind of coming in and, and sensing there's a difference here. Uh, there's something different about, you know, what's happening here. It's very solemn. It was very quiet, uh, peaceful. And uh, we knew when we came into church on Good Friday that, you know, we're really here to commemorate and to uh, commemorate the Lord's passion. Um, and uh, we would even go forward. You know, we go forward to venerate the cross um, each and every Good Friday. And, and uh, so that's a memory that I, I grew up with. But I, for the most part, you know, I, uh, other than that, my, uh, you know, my, my friends who are Catholic things, you know, is always, uh, kind of, you know, unfortunately they didn't really know a lot about their faith and, uh, you know, so much so that I, I was, uh, really trying to evangelize some of them and bring them kind of over to the light. And, um, you know, so, uh, yeah, that's, so that kind of gets a, a little bit of how I grew up and, and also kind of the culture I was in. Again, very strong Christian environment, um, a little bit of anti, uh, you know, a little bit of anti-Catholicism, but not not real bad. Uh, you know, I never, you know, we never thought like Catholics were all going to hell or anything like that. But um, but it was, uh, you know, it it was different, and it was something where we certainly desired for Catholics kind of come over on our side and, and you know see see the light. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. Nathan Wigfield is with us. He is executive director of the St. Thomas More House of Prayer, liturgyofthehours.org. 
is where you can find it. Um, yeah, we're, we're heading into the first break here, but before we get there, Nathan, in terms of, we, we always want to try to follow the grace here. Certainly there was a sincere faith in Christ, and certainly there would have been a, a, a faith in your interpretation, whatever it would have been in that denomination of the Bible of Christ that you're, you're reading in the Gospels. So all that is good. Um, and at the same time, though, the, the sacramental life of the Catholic Church that he came to bring us, was there any sense of that um, existing? Was there um, the, the sacrament of baptism, for instance, was that something um, that, that you, you were able to see the value and get baptized in as a young age? Or was that also just something that wasn't on the radar in terms of the particular denomination? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, this is this certainly isn't true for everybody who grow up, grows up in the Christian Missionary Alliance Church. But uh, looking back on it, I've, you know, I've said certainly after becoming Catholic, but, uh, you know, looking back, I, you know, it's really hard for me to, uh, to believe that what happened really happened. Um, and that is that, you know, I went through uh, my entire upbringing and I don't, I do not remember a single time uh, beginning to talk about or even it coming up, you know, do you want to get baptized? Um, and so, uh, you know, it was, you know, that was, something again looking back i was like how could i grow up in the church for you know 20 years and never you know it never be presented to me that hey uh you know would you like to be baptized um so uh so yeah sacramentally it was definitely it was definitely lacking hmm. all right well, when we get back we're going to hear some more of Nathan's story. Nathan Wigfield is with us and uh, particularly looking forward to connecting the dots, seeing um, how he was able to, to find out the truth about not just Jesus, but about his Catholic church that he died to give us and that fullness of the sacramental life and what happened when he saw that, said yes, entered in. Uh, so excited to hear Nathan's story when we get back. Stay tuned. At the Station of the Cross, we are blessed by the variety of donations our listeners generously contribute for our evangelization efforts. From planned gifts to employer matches, we even receive donations through transfers of stock. Please consider giving a gift of stock to help us continue sharing the love of God with our hurting world. If you are being called by God to donate through a transfer of stock from your brokerage account to ours, please ask your broker to contact us at 1-877-888-6279. Your broker will need to indicate the number of shares being transferred as well as the QCIP number of those shares. That's one 877 888-6279. Thank you for considering a gift of stock to the Station of the Cross so that we can continue proclaiming the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. Do you love listening to the Station of the Cross on your car radio, but sometimes find yourself driving outside the listening area? Never miss another minute of your favorite show. Download the iCatholic Radio app so you can listen anywhere in the world 24 hours a day. The iCatholic Radio app is available for your phone in the Apple Store or for your Android phone in Google Play. Visit thestationofthecross.com for more information. Keep up on the shows we bring you each day by viewing our programming guide on thestationofthecross.com. You can view our full schedule, the prime time grid, or even find a printable version on our website for your convenience. It's all at thestationofthecross.com under the programming tab, or on our free and continuously updated iCatholic Radio app for your Android or Apple device. Simple Truth. Jim Havens here with our guest today, Nathan Wakefield. He's a Catholic husband and father, executive director of the St. Thomas More House of Prayer, Liturgy of the Hours. Dot org to learn more. Nathan, before we uh, before we move on in your story as you're sharing some of your uh, personal testimony with us today, I want to ask you uh, just again a, a little bit about what we were talking about at the end of the first segment. I'm not I'm not familiar with the um, the Christian Missionary Alliance, so this is the first I'm actually hearing about it. 
and I'm not I'm not all that up on all the different denominations and where they stand and everything. But I do want to ask you just a little bit further because of that name, Christian Missionary Alliance. So I would be thinking that they would have a, a real missionary thrust to them, a missionary zeal uh, for souls. And yet um, you were saying that they didn't really have any um, any value for baptism. They didn't really see the, the sacrament of baptism as being something um, that would have been necessary or something that they were um, doing or offering to people. And, and yet I just want to drill down on this in, in the end of the Gospel of Matthew. As we know, we've got the Great Commission there from Jesus himself when he approaches and says to them, all power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always until the end of the age. So I would think that this would have been a key scripture for a group that was focused on sharing the mission of Christ in the world, and yet they were missing that aspect of baptism. Any, anything else that you could speak to just give us more insight on this? Yeah, you know, it's, again, I don't want to kind of paint with broad, broad strokes. Um, You know, I I think it's, it's, it perhaps is different, you know, wherever, uh, you know, different places around the world, different place, uh, different churches, uh, different pastors approach it a little bit differently, even the denomination as a whole, I think even has an emphasis on baptism and on the Great Commission. You're right uh, to say Christian Missionary Alliance is a denomination that from its very inception, it was started by A.B. Simpson uh, back in the early 1900s. It was a, uh, he had left the Presbyterian Church and started this denomination. Uh, it was specifically, it began with a, a ministry of evangelization to the poor. I believe it was in New York City, um, but uh, really spread throughout the world, and they have a strong missionary presence uh, throughout the world. So again, I, I don't want to uh, necessarily say, you know, they're kind of missing something, uh, you know, as a denomination in terms of, you know, stressing baptism. Uh, but in my particular experience, it was never brought up. And I, I certainly witnessed, I remember witnessing baptisms, but here, here's the, here's the thing that was, was the, was the problem. The problem was that baptism was seen as something, um, something that was altogether, it was good, but it was altogether unnecessary for salvation. And so it was seen as the, the emphasis was put on one's personal commitment to Christ that you make through prayer, uh, specifically the sinner's prayer, as they would call it, or, you know, accepting Christ into your heart. And that was the moment of salvation. And so, you know, and you would even want to do that, you know, you could do that privately, but then you'd also want to... for you'd want that to happen publicly as well. So they would have public professions of faith. So, you know, I remember going to conferences and things like that where they'd have altar calls. And, you know, my mom would tell me, you know, hey, th- you know, I know you already accepted Jesus into your heart, but it's important that you, maybe you go forward to make a public profession of your faith. Well, this was never thought about with regards to baptism. It was never presented that way. It was, you know, and if I did want to be baptized. I suspect that it would it would have been emphasized that you're doing this as a basically as a a public profession of what has already happened in your heart. And so, uh, but that never happened for me. That never happened for me. It was never stressed. It was never something that you kind of weighed like, oh, you do you want to be baptized? Is it you know is it the right time to be baptized? And so I was 21 years old, uh, maybe 22. When, um, you know, this kind of fast forwards in my story, but uh, we, my wife and I ended up, uh, we, we really felt called to go and to, to help a group of people out in Southern California plant churches after we graduated from college. And I was talking to a friend of mine who was the lead pastor of this church plant, and uh, we were riding our bikes through Long Beach, and I don't know how baptism came up, but he said, you know, he said, so when were you baptized? <laughs> And I had to think about it. And I was like, you know what? I don't, I don't think I've ever been baptized. And uh, this was just a moment where I was like, I was almost embarrassed. I was like, man, how is it that I've never been baptized? That can't be true. And so I remember calling my, my parents and asking, you know, have I been baptized? And they're like, no, I, I don't think you ever have, you know. And um, so, again, it's just it, I see this as the result of this separation. There's no sacramental reality. There's no... There's nothing that is affected in the sacrament. Um, it's seen simply as a public profession of, uh, of something that happened either privately 
or maybe another kind of another time where you were able to profess your faith publicly, um, but it wasn't seen as you know actually being a, a conduit or actually a source of grace. That already that already happens. Uh, baptism uh, simply. Uh, is a, a manifestation or a profession of, of what has already happened in one's heart. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And I just want to share for, for the listeners, for the viewers today. So we, we would um, just be clear on it. So the fact is, is that, yeah, there would be actual grace, what we would call actual grace, certainly a sincere faith in Christ as you would, as you would come to understand him. Of course, those acts of faith, um, those are wonderful and those would be efficacious. Um, and at the same time, though, right, Jesus did give us this, uh, this great sacrament of baptism as a way to enter the new covenant, just like in the old covenant, there was circumcision. In the new covenant, there's baptism. So it's actually the, the entrance in, right, that opens the way up to the entire sacramental life and allows us to be able to receive that sanctifying grace from our Lord that um, that remits original sin. The, the, certainly the concupiscence remains after baptism, but the, the, the original sin itself, um, we are freed from it, right? We are freed and now enter into that uh, that, that grace, that glorious freedom of the children of God that we are called to then grow in for the length of our lives. But as Nathan was sharing, we are in a time where there is a lack of catechesis, a lack of understanding of these things. It's so easy uh, to get confused about them. Um, and so Nathan, w when you're coming to then understand, I guess you're, you're 21 when you get baptized, where are you at that point? You're in your college years, I, I would guess, but um, what was the sense that um, you're getting baptized? Was that, that was not any sense of what we would know in the Catholic Church? as baptism really or or how did you see it at that time what was the the consequences as, as you saw it of getting baptized baptized at that age yeah i think uh at that point you know it was after college um so we were in long beach california we were helping to plant a a new a new church um i know that kind of language is foreign to maybe you know catholics uh, we don't really go around starting new churches we're part of the one historic you know holy catholic church but uh, but nonetheless, we're we're out there. We're we're starting this church plant, and um, and I, you know, the lead pastor of this church plant, you know, says, you know, have you been baptized? I say, you know, no, I don't think I have. So we immediately got, uh, you know, got that on the calendar. And uh, I'm very thankful to say that, you know, it was a Trinitarian baptism, and uh, you know, I was baptized. And I think, you know, at that point, I was also in seminary, so I was beginning to begin to be, beginning to understand. Kind of a, a trinitarian uh, theology of baptism where you know it wasn't just a public profession of faith but, but this was the ordinary means by which uh, we came to be adopted into uh, the family of god uh, both in the you know in the holy trinity to be adopted you know as sons in christ uh, but to uh, but to also kind of you know enter into uh, formally um, and effectively enter into the life of the church um, at that point i don't I don't think I, uh, the, the part of remitting original sin was still not part of my vocabulary at that point. Um, so that, that would come later. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, that was at that point, that was the extent of my, my understanding of baptism. It was still, it was still growing, but I, I can say this, you know, one of the things that was very, you know, significant for me, you know, in, I remember when I was baptized is that, you know, is that this was something that, uh, it was stressed, you know, I, back in college, I had uh, someone who discipled me who was very reformed in faith. He's a Presbyterian, uh, very, you know, a great guy, uh, conservative theologically. Um, and, uh, you know, he really stressed that baptism was uh, this kind of uh, covenant and God, it was God's initiative. I remember talking to him about the differences between infant baptism and adult baptism and that kind of thing. And uh, at this point, I was really coming to see baptism as this this act of God, God choosing us and bringing us into his family, into his kingdom, and that we were uh, coming, you know, when we come to baptism, that we are consenting to that. We are asking for that, and uh, we are recipients of that grace. Um, so I, I definitely, you know, baptism was, was still very meaningful for me, but uh, it still did not have the fullness of, uh, like you say, you know, I, I still at that point didn't have the full catechesis uh, on what the sacrament was and all it all it meant. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, what a, what a blessing. The Lord was uh, continuing to draw you in. And so, yeah, I guess just connect some dots for us leading up to the time where you're starting to discover that, wow, it seems like the Catholic Church is the real deal here. I've got to, I've got to deal with this. How, how did that all come to be? Yeah, well, in evangelical Christianity at that time, um, this was back around 2007, 2008, uh, there was, you know, as I said, I was in seminary, and there was a lot of emphasis on uh, liturgy, tradition, and going back to roots and discovering uh, writings from the lives of the saints. Um, you know, in our little church plant, we were celebrating what we thought was the Eucharist every Sunday. And, um, you know, it, it was, uh, you know, we were, without knowing it, we were really seeking roots because we didn't have any. You know, we didn't, we didn't have any roots, and all of a sudden, you know, we start to go back, and we start to read, and we start to read how different early Christianity is from what we're doing. Um, actually, uh, as a side note, our church plant was called Origins, because the idea was to get back to the origins of the early church, to get back, you know, kind of get through all of that uh, kind of that medieval kind of dark ages, you know, get back to the pure gospel. You know, we kind of, even the Reformation, you know, we don't want to necessarily just kind of want to assume that the, the traditions that came out of the Reformation were right, but we want to get back to the pure, pure gospel. And, uh, you know, I can say thanks be to God, uh, the deeper and the, the more I looked into uh, the history of the church uh, and read the original sources, the more, you know, I came to realize that this is far from anything that we're practicing and anything that we're, we're doing. Um, certainly you have some similarities here and there, but um, I remember uh, when a friend had introduced me for the first time to the early church fathers, you know, we were reading source texts, you know, Ambrose of Milan, Milan Cyril of Jerusalem. Uh, we were looking at Augustine and, um, you know, going back to even Irenaeus, Ignatius of Antioch. And, you know, we're reading about, you know, the Holy Eucharist. We're reading about bishops and priests and, you know, the, uh, the other sacraments, the veneration of the saints, the mother of God. I mean, you name it. It was all there, um, you, know, you know, certainly the liturgy, the mass. Um, and uh, I just remember thinking, like, wait a second. I, I mean, I, I, I didn't have a lot of experience in Catholicism at this point, but I had enough to, to think, begin thinking, this sounds a lot like the Catholic Church. And so that was really the moment when I started to think to myself, like, man, maybe, you know, maybe I got to at least kind of test this out a little bit. And so that's when I I really started to get my feet wet. And I I started to kind of secretly go to mass uh, every so often. And, you know, when my wife and I would go off to vacation, we'd I'd try to get her to come with me to the nearest cathedral and we would, you know, go. And um, but I guess I'll 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 get into that uh, in the next segment. I hear the music starting. Yeah, we'll be right back with Nathan Wigfield. More on him sharing some of his personal testimony with us today. But one thing just to, to notice, right, is that openness when you're confronted with truth that, um, you know, it might be hard to, to go that route, but the truth is leading you there. Do you have that openness, that humility to go? We'll be right back. Stay tuned. This is Life News Radio. I'm Jim Anderson. A district attorney elected with support from billionaire George Soros has squared off with Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. DeSantis has suspended State Attorney Andrew Warren for failing to prosecute laws like Florida's 15-week abortion ban. Critics of such arrangements say that states vest veto power in governors, not in prosecutors and not in their campaign donors. Texas AG Ken Paxton wants a federal court in Lubbock to block one of President Biden's schemes to enable abortion practice in all 50 states. The White House wants to use a law that requires ER departments to stabilize indigent patients to instead require doctors to stabilize some pregnancies with abortion. Another tactic to neutralize state abortion restrictions comes from Senator Patty Murray of Washington State. Her bill to federally bar prosecution of abortionists failed in the U.S. Senate Thursday. This is Life News Radio. What is the one failure that comes before every elective abortion? It is a failure on the part of two people, a man and a woman, to understand their true vocation, their true calling by God as to how they should use their entire life for him and for others. So pray for an end to abortion, but pray also that human souls would find their true and holy vocation. 
In other stories, researcher Dr. Michael New is offering three key lessons behind the failure of a pro-life Kansas initiative Tuesday, and 1,000 children born last year are alive in Poland thanks to a law eliminating abortion in cases of children tested and suspected with a disability. Pro-life doctors are quick to note a high rate of error in such testing. For pro-life headlines delivered to your email address daily, sign up at lifenews.com. This has been Life News Radio. Welcome back to The Simple Truth. Jim Havens here. Testimony Tuesday. We are on some holy ground here with Nathan Wigfield sharing some of his personal testimony with us. He's a Catholic husband and father, executive director of the St. Thomas More House of Prayer, a Catholic retreat center in the Diocese of Erie, Pennsylvania, that has the mission of praying and promoting the Liturgy of the Hours. You can learn more about it by going to liturgyofthehours.org. And also in the final segment today, Nathan is going to share more about his good work there with the St. Thomas More House of Prayer. But in this segment, and Nathan, the floor is yours. Feel free to go wherever you're called to do, but I would love it if you could uh, connect the dots or lead us into, I'd love to hear your experience of finally coming into the Catholic Church, what that would have been like in your experience of then entering into um, an experience of our Lord in the sacra- in, in the fullness of the sacramental life with respect to uh, confession, penance, with, with respect to uh, receiving the Holy Eucharist, uh, the sacrament of confirmation. What did it do uh, for, for you guys in the sacrament of matrimony? Like it's a whole new life coming in. So I'd love to hear some of that experience, especially when you would have had such a, a rich life as an evangelical before that. What was that experience life how, like? How did it match up? What was the experience of those differences? And um, yeah, it's, it's just a beautiful thing to hear um, faithful, sincere, faithful uh, Protestants who then become Catholic. And I just want to say to anybody who might be listening that might be a sincere, faithful Protestant who, who might even be considering to any degree the Catholic Church, I, I just want to say we need you, right? Your faith alive in the sacramental life of the Catholic Church that Jesus died to give us, that's what we need. We need some people with that holy fire of faith alive in the fullness of the sacramental life. Um, but Nathan, share with us your experience. Yeah, so after I was introduced to the fathers and started attending Mass just out of curiosity, um, I was really grateful. I mean, by God's providence, I ended up uh, having a friend who was also reading the fathers, and um, he ended up converting. And, you know, I remember um, I remember going to his confirmation and when he was received into the church and he was, he was ready to go. I mean, he had gone to seminary with me, so he's uh, well-educated. He had uh, very well-read, knew the faith very well. And uh, as he met with a, a local priest, you know, the priest had just decided, you know, discerned that, you know, there's no reason kind of making you wait for Easter. So I think it was the middle of summer or something that um, he, my friend Gabriel, came into the church. And it was actually at the, at the cathedral in, uh, in the city of Pittsburgh and uh, where we were living at the time. And I remember being there, it was before the early morning mass. So it was, I think it was around 7 a.m. And uh, the only people that were there for Gabriel's reception into the church were five of us. And we were all Protestant. <laughs> and I just remember looking on and, and thinking to myself, you know what? I think this is where this all ends. I think this is where the fathers are leading us. And my heart, that's the moment when my heart really started to desire it and long for it. And so uh, that just really, that kind of started a, a, a more intense uh, journey for me of discerning, you know, how it is that the Lord's going to bring this about. Because at the time, uh, my wife was not the least bit interested in becoming Catholic. Thankfully, she was very supportive of me and um, she, was, she saw where my heart was and she wanted to do everything she could to at least walk alongside of me and try to understand where I was I was coming from and where I, where I thought the Lord was leading. And so she did RCIA with me. We entered an RCIA program. She was not going to become Catholic, but she really wanted to do this with me. And, uh, and so we discerned throughout the whole RCIA program, um, there in Pittsburgh, uh, praying together and really seeking the Lord's will. Uh, and when it came the beginning of Lent, uh, I believe this was in, Let's see, it's uh, 
this is back around 2014, um, that 2015, that, you know, we were, uh, you know, Bethany essentially gave her my blessing, just said, you know, if this is really where you feel like the Lord's leading you, then I think you need to, you need to become Catholic. And, and so we vowed to continue to make Christ the center of our marriage. And, uh, but we were going to be doing that in very different, we were going to be pursuing and, and, uh, kind of living out the faith in very different ways. And, uh, and so, um, we actually, once I came into the church, uh, we were going to each other's churches. So I would, you know, we would go to mass at nine o'clock and then I jump over to her Presbyterian church at 10 o'clock. And, you know, that happened, that went on for about a year before, um, thanks be to God. I mean, you know, uh, Bethany, we ended up, we ended up meeting some really great families at our local parish there in Pittsburgh. And even though Bethany wasn't quite ready to become Catholic yet, she, she started to see the truth. I, I think she started to see, uh, the light, the lights were starting to come on. And, um, and, and so she was just like, okay, that's, that's enough. You know, we're just going to go to mass. And I was like, I was, you know, I was ecstatic. I was glad I was, you know, we could be, it was a, as a path towards greater oneness and unity in our marriage. So, um, so that's kind of where we, uh, you know, kind of, I guess where we got to, you know, uh, by the time I had, I had converted, I, I do want to take a step back though. And, and just say, you know, when I was, when I was going through RCIA and coming into the church, you know, I'd say for, you know, for Bethany, who wasn't yet ready and was just kind of, you know, coming alongside of and seeking to support. And, you know, there was a, I cannot stress how important it was for us both to, to meet Catholics who are just, uh, very, um, just normal people who love the Lord, who, uh, were very hospitable to us, who invited us over for dinner, who took us out, you know, took us out to, uh, to dinner, to talk with us and to have conversations with us and to hear our questions and, you know, and even to just kind of listen as we kind of expressed how difficult of a time this was for us in our discernment. And, uh, you know, when, once I did become Catholic and we started going to mass to be, you know, in a parish with a priest who was very welcoming to Bethany and where there were so many great Catholic families uh, there that we were meeting. Uh, it was just, you know, I, 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 I like to say that, you know, when, um, when we came into the church, it was very, we didn't know a whole lot of people, but once we were in the church and we started to settle into a parish, we met so many. And I really think, you know, Bethany's path to Catholicism came through friendship. And, um, and that was really, that was really important uh, for, uh, for her to experience the fullness of Catholicism and the fullness of the truth, but to do it through relationships. Uh, so that was a, a real gift to us. Hmm. Very cool. And at this point, um, would you have already had um, some children running around? What was what was family life like by, by this point? Yeah. So at this point, we had we had no kids. Um, we were uh, we had been. Well, I don't know. We've been married now for 16 years. So let's see, I, I've been Catholic for going on eight years. So this was uh, back around, you know, seven, eight years married. Um, and, uh, you know, part of our story is that, you know, we, um, you know, we, again, kind of going back to, uh, kind of, I think, the, the poverty um, of, of a lot of kind of, you know, the evangelical kind of uh, Protestant experience is, you know, things that are, it's not only things that are um, maybe that we have di hold different views on, but things that are just entirely missed altogether. Uh, and so like with uh, baptism, one of the things that was to a total miss was, uh, was contraception. And, uh, and so we, um, you know, when we got married, um, you know, we immediate our mindset was, oh, let's wait, you know, five years till we have kids and uh, we'll kind of, you know, then we'll evaluate and see if that's what we want to do. And, um, and that was just normal. I mean, like, again, I did not grow up in a nominal Christian family, you know, that, you know, uh, you know, in evangelicalism, you know, that's a normal experience is you just kind of like uh, family having, uh, you know, large families, when I say large families, I mean, even like three or four is, is considered an anomaly so and the exception to the norm so uh, for us we waited and then unfortunately we ended up um, you know our first pregnancy uh, resulted in miscarriage and then after that um, we kind of struggled with infertility for the for the longest time and um, 
And so as, as we were uh, kind of going through this conversion process, and uh, I should say, you know, Bethany ended up coming into the church, you know, four years after me, and she had a, her own story is just is really profound. I mean, she had some really powerful experiences with our Lord and the Blessed Sacrament. Uh, she was coming to Eucharistic Adoration uh, regularly, and, um, you know, she was, uh, I, I still remember her kind of saying it to me at one point, she said, you know, the Eucharist is really going to get me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was thinking to myself, yes, <laughs> all right, you know, and uh, so, you know, the Lord just, uh, it was a really beautiful way the Lord brought her, brought her into the church. But at the time, I mean, we were, you know, really discerning how do we, you know, how are we going to, you know, is the Lord calling us to grow our family, you know, if not naturally through, uh, then through adoption. And so um, it wasn't long after we came into the church that we actually, uh, we, we adopted and uh, we adopted our, our first, uh, our first daughter from, uh, or our daughter from birth, uh, Ava. Uh, she was, um, she's now five. Uh, and then nine months after she was born, we got a call from the adoption agency uh, you know, saying that they had a couple boys, they were four and five at the time, who needed a home. And, uh, and so, you know, again, we're just seeking to be open to the Lord's will. I say, you know, okay, that's great. You know, we'll pray about it. We'll, we'll kind of discern. And, and when do we have to let you know? And, and they said, well, they actually need a home tonight. So, <laughs> um, so we ended up just talking about it briefly on the phone and uh, just, you know, really feeling like, well, hey, you know, I think, uh, the Lord's blessing would be on this. And so uh, we opened up our home to these uh, four and five-year-old boys, Xavier and Elijah, and they're now nine and 10. We adopted them. We were able to adopt them after uh, six months of, of foster care. And, uh, and so we're now a, a family of five. And, and thanks be to God, uh, we are now um, expecting. And, uh, and so we're just uh, so thrilled. Um, this pregnancy has been the longest, uh, that we've had. We've had three miscarriages, uh, and, uh, we just, you know, I guess this is a way of, you know, for all you listeners, you can pray for us, um, you know, as we're on this journey, Bethany's 18 weeks now. And, uh, so we're really, uh, starting to get hopeful. So, yeah. Wow. So beautiful. Yes. Everybody pray for Nathan and Bethany and the, the little child growing in the womb and their entire family. What, what a beautiful, beautiful aspect of this story. Um, so, um, well, one thing I do want to mention, I, I want to throw a resource out there for anybody that might be confused about, uh, contraception, the church's teaching, all of that. This is a pretty good resource by Patrick Coffin. It's a book he wrote on this called the contraception deception, Catholic teaching on birth control. So this is one, um, you can check out and, and get a, a thorough understanding of what the, the Catholic teaching actually Actually is in this area um, but um, but you know one of the things that the things that impresses me from your story Nathan is just you know a truth is put before you and you you seem just so sincere and open and humble to be able to receive that truth and, and I'm sure that you know that there were times of difficulty of course um, but I don't know any words of um, advice to folks that are uh, maybe dealing with different steps in their own journey and coming up against things that eh, maybe they don't necessarily want to know or want to see but the truth is right there and um, it might be difficult to say yes and enter into it um, but how do they do it anyway or any just words of encouragement for them in, in just trusting God and his plan saying yes to whatever his grace is putting before you and calling you into yeah I think the you know the big thing is just being open to the truth and you know it's it's a very rare thing um, you know, in many circles today, uh, for, you know, Christian, non-Christian uh, alike, um, for uh, there to be a real spirit of kind of relativism. And, uh, you know, I even see it in, you know, in evangelicals, that, you know, very strong, you know, uh, evangelical Christians who, um, you know, have gone from real deep conviction, even sometimes at times, a real anti-Catholicism to kind of a, you know, almost a well, you know, if that's what's good for them, you know, and it's, it's this loss of conviction that there is truth out there and that we are, you know, that we, we can actually know it, that God's not kind of trying to trick us. He's not playing games. He, he's actually given us a means by which to know what is true, what is good, what is beautiful, and to live our lives accordingly, according to that truth. And so I would just say, you know, for those who are, are seeking the Lord, Continue to seek the Lord. Continue to seek the truth. The truth is there. The truth will set us free. Christ promised it, and He's given us He's given us the Holy Catholic Church to show us the way. 
Um, he hasn't left us in the dark. He promised that he wouldn't leave us or forsake us, that he wouldn't leave us as orphans, but that he would give us the light and that he would lead us home. And, you know, my experience has been that, is that that home is in the Catholic Church. And it's just, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's an amazing blessing, such a great joy. Yeah, what a, what a great blessing indeed. We are so blessed. We, we, we ought to be very humble, grateful, faithful before the great treasure that is ours in Jesus and his Catholic Church. When we come back, we're going to hear more about that authentic prayer entering into the church's liturgy of the hours. What's that all about? We'll be right back. Stay tuned. A prayer to the sacred heart that St. Gertrude the Great wrote. I salute thee, O sacred heart of Jesus, living and vivifying source of eternal life infinite treasure of the divinity ardent furnace of divine love thou art the place of my repose and my refuge enkindle in my heart the fire of that ardent love with which thine own is inflamed pour into my heart the great graces of which thine is the source and grant that my heart may be so closely united to thine that thy will may be mine, and that my will may be eternally conformed to thine, since I desire that henceforth thy holy will may be the rule of all my desires and all my actions. Amen. You can listen to any of our network-produced programs at your convenience, wherever you enjoy podcasts. Hear a powerful sermon you need to share with a loved one? Maybe there's a guest or teaching segment that deserves another listen. You can find all of our shows on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Podcasts, our website, and the free iCatholic Radio app. Be uplifted in your faith. Listen today at thestationofthecross.com or on your favorite podcasting platform. As a nonprofit lay organization financially independent from your diocese, our apostolate is listener supported. Through your generosity, we are able to inspire countless listeners with the gospel message and help lead them to a parish to be spiritually nourished by the sacraments. The Station of the Cross thanks our supporters who have enabled us to broadcast Catholic programs for more than 20 years. Thank you for your continued support and may God bless you and your family. Jim Havens here with our guest today, Nathan Wakefield, a Catholic husband and father, executive director of the St. Thomas More House of Prayer, liturgyofthehours.org to learn more. We're going to be talking about that in just a bit. And one way I guess I'd like to get into this final segment and getting into your good work, Nathan, um, with St. Thomas More House of Prayer is um, is this missionary thrust, right? We, we are called to go forth and to make disciples. It does flow from the words of our Lord Jesus himself, this great commission uh, that he has laid upon his church. And so as we enter more and more into his life, we ought to be um, entering more and more into that mission identity um, how has this how, how has this experience been for you in, in this sense of this missionary identity coming alive in you um, in union with our Lord Jesus so um, by the grace of the the Holy Spirit and and how has this then connected you into being the executive director of st. Thomas More House of Prayer yeah so when uh, not long after I became Catholic it was about a year you know I had been trained in seminary uh, I had read a uh, I read a lot of the fathers. Um, I was studying the Catholic faith. I was eating up all I could from, you know, books by Scott Hahn and Mike Aquilina. And, you know, it's, uh, yeah, I was just like, I was diving all in. Um, and so, you know, I had uh, a real, I mean, you know, I had a conviction that this is what's true. I, you know, I always say, you know, you don't become Catholic because you want better liturgy or because you kind of like the way that the, you know, the churches are built or that you kind of like how they do, you know, this or that, you know, it, it, you don't, all those are tangential uh, for become when it comes to becoming Catholic. You know, when you stand before the bishop and you say, I believe and profess everything that is, you know, taught and professed uh, by the Catholic Church is, uh, is true and is revealed by God. I mean, you really want to mean it, right? You know, so, um, so I believed all that with all my heart. And, and so a year after, you know, I'd gotten to know this priest uh, of the parish that we were going to and he had, uh, he invited me, you know, to come on. I still had a real heart for discipleship. 
uh, to do that with, especially with adults. I, I really wanted to lead people deeper in their relationship with Christ now from the heart of the Catholic Church. And uh, so he just invited me to come on board with his staff. He was, uh, he was, an, um, he was uh, just newly installed as a, as a pastor of this parish. And, uh, and so, you know, I really um, saw that as a sign from the Lord, that the Lord is just really blessing uh, this desire that he had given me and um, was giving me this opportunity. So that's, that's how uh, it started for me was uh, working for this parish where I had an opportunity to to share uh, the beauty, the truth, the wisdom of the Catholic faith uh, with so many, and um, and mostly young adults. I mean, we were doing, uh, you know, we had a really intensive discipleship group at our parish uh, where we were, you know, re- we had a three-year track. And so, you know, everybody's committed to kind of meeting every other week. We had a rule of life together, which was included praying the liturgy of the hours. And when we'd get together, we'd have dinner, we'd pray evening prayer, and then we'd, uh, we'd discuss, you know, different writings of the saints. And so, uh, you know, we, we started on, you know, with the Desert Fathers on, on the life of asceticism and spiritual discipline. And then the second year was with the medieval mystics and prayer and contemplation. And then the third year was on the sacred liturgy. And, uh, and so uh, while we were doing this group, this is what led to the St. Thomas More House of Prayer. We were looking for a place to go on retreat. And uh, we came across this uh, place online and, it seemed rather obscure. I'd never heard of it before, and uh, but it pictures looked beautiful, and so uh, we all said, you know, hey, this sounds like a great idea. Let's do this for a weekend. So the first time we came here, it was just, uh, I mean, it was an incredible experience. Such a place of of prayer. It's like you know when you go into those places where, um, you know, especially those chapels and those churches and those retreat centers, those places where. Uh, you know, the Lord is, is certainly present sacramentally, but then also where people have just labored such in, in, in so many hours in prayer, it's just, it's felt uh, not only in your spirit, but even physically. And that was what it felt like here. And, uh, and so we kept coming back. And, uh, and a big part of that was because we were very committed to the liturgy of the hours and that being a, a big part of our spiritual life. So praying morning and evening prayer, committing to that on a daily basis. And then whenever we'd gather together, praying evening prayer together. And so the liturgy, uh, the St. Thomas More House of Prayer was this place that, you know, no matter if they had guests or not, you know, they prayed all seven canonical hours, starting with office of readings at 530 in the morning and going all the way through the day till uh, night prayer, at eight o'clock. And so when we would come, we'd just join in to this prayer that was already happening and, uh, and be able to do it in this, uh, this small little Catholic community here um, in, uh, in Cranberry, Pennsylvania. And so, uh, you know, this is getting to kind of, you know, what led me to, uh, to be here as an executive director. It was some years after we started coming here that, you know, this was, it was a Catholic family who founded this, uh, this retreat center, Wayne and Patty Hepler, and they had 13 kids. And uh, they, they themselves were converts who came into the church through the Catholic Church's teaching on contraception and, um, and you know, Paul VI's uh, document on Humana Vitae. And so uh, just great family life here. But they, they ran this retreat center as a family. You know, I remember, you know, uh, Carrie's her name. She was kind of in charge of guests, uh, welcoming guests. And, you know, whenever our groups would come up here, you know, she'd come up with three or four of her kids. She had, a, you know, 11 kids. You know, so three or four of them would come up, you know, the little ones, and, you know, she'd kind of show us around, make sure we were settled in. So, but the last time that we were here, I had such a powerful uh, time of prayer and was really just uh, overwhelmed, so much so that when I went back, I didn't even tell Bethany I was doing this. I had sent an email over and said, you know, hey, would you ever be interested in having someone, you know, take care of the house of prayer full time and be a director? And, you know, promote the Liturgy of the Hours because, you know, it's something that I'm very passionate about. And um, I did not think I would get a yes. Yeah, I mean, I really did. That's why I didn't even tell my wife. Well, I got an email back either that day or the very next day uh, saying, yes, we would love to have that conversation. <laughs> so then I had some explaining to do. <laughs> and uh, so long story short, we went through a, a period of discernment, about six months, uh, discerning if this was the Lord's will. We make, made several trips up here and um, and, uh, it was a difficult decision. We had so many good friends in Pittsburgh. It's where we both had become Catholic and really had settled into the church. And, you know, we had such good relationships with, uh, some of the local priests there. And, uh, and so, but, uh, we really felt like this is where the Lord was leading. And so, um, 
the opportunity was there and uh, we took it and, uh, you know, and now that's what I do. I serve as the executive director of the St. Thomas More House of Prayer. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I can, I can get into my work, my work here if you like, but I don't know if you wanted to pause and take that in a different direction or not. No, very, very cool. Yes, please. We only have a couple of minutes to go. Please share with us uh, different opportunities that might be available for folks at the St. Thomas More House of Prayer. Sure. So our mission is very simple. We pray and promote the liturgy of the hours. So we're also a retreat center. So we host guests and groups on the retreats. Uh, but what what makes us go, what, you know, the real reason for our existence is the prayer of the church. And the liturgy of the hours is, a lot of people don't know this, it's part of the sacred liturgy of the Catholic Church. Together with the Mass, it forms the whole of the sacred liturgy and the, and the sacraments. And so um, the prayer, you know, what that basically means is that, you know, the, the liturgy of the hours is not primarily our prayer. It's the prayer of Christ himself. And as the catechism teaches and the general instructions on the liturgy of the hours, you know, the, the liturgy of the hours, the prayer of the church is the means by which we are able to join in the prayer of Christ. And it's also the way by which we can sanctify the world, sanctify time, and, um, and make that perfect offering, that sacrifice of praise through the Son and the Holy Spirit to God the Father. And so uh, this is a great privilege that we have to, uh, to be able to pray this prayer each and every day. And so when uh, individuals and groups come to our retreat center, uh, we welcome them uh, to join us. They come and join us for any or all of the hours. And, um, and then we also, uh, we're very intentional about kind of teaching. We're kind of a teaching apostolate as well. So putting out online resources, ways that uh, people can learn to pray the Liturgy of the Hours. We host Liturgy of the Hours retreats that, you know, give the history of theology and practical guide to praying the Liturgy of the Hours. So uh, really, we're, we want to help people to pray. And the church has given us, like in so many examples, the ch church has given us the perfect prayer by which we, not because of anything we do, but because it's the prayer of Christ himself. And we get to join in that each and every day. And uh, it's such a gift, you know, it's such a gift that we have received. And uh, it's just, uh, we make this offering here at the St. Thomas More House of Prayer, you know, seven times a day, every day of the year. So. Hmm. Awesome. Liturgyofthehours.org to learn more. St. Thomas More House of Prayer. Nathan Wigfield, what a blessing to have you with us today sharing some of your story. Thank you so much. Hey, thanks for having me. It's been a blast. Oh.